So we've made it. Over 500 hours in, every achievement, every raid boss, every item, every build. I've completed Borderlands 3. Did I have fun? Yeah, but I'd never do it again. I want to finish Borderlands 3 on a high note with perfect or close to perfect builds for every character and wipe away every enemy in existence. Something I haven't even done for Borderlands 2. And I love Borderlands 2. I guess it helps that I only had 4 characters to work with. To leave no stone unturned means collecting every legendary item. We'll be excluding any joke weapons we need to buy with real money. I've copied a spreadsheet that details every legendary item in the game. We will not be doing every unique item, simply because I don't want to. This challenge is pointless enough as it is. I thought finding every legendary was supposed to be the easy part, but you know what they say. A hundred more legendaries means a hundred more objectives. It goes to show just how massive this game is. There are some bosses I've never even seen before. Now I'm not gonna bore you with the details, it's just standard legendary hunting, but it's times like these where I wish the drop rate was higher. It starts to get to a point where I'm remembering every single legendary I've gotten, which is not a good thing by the way. Feed your mind with useful information instead of the names of fictional weapons, especially when they're in the hundreds. It's easy to lie and simply say I got every legendary so I don't have to spend hours on footage no one's gonna see, but in the end I'd only be lying to myself. What's better than seeing a completed inventory is knowing that I did that. Finally, we can move on to achievements. Let's get some easy ones out of the way. Might be on sight. This was news to me. I didn't know the mysterious amulet did something here. I remember that was a big mystery back in the Borderlands 2 days. Invisible Iridium Piles. There's a spot on Voracious Canopy that's full of them. Plus, it's a good way to farm Iridium. Here's a tip. Once you figure out the pattern, equip any stone prefix artifacts so you can get even more Iridium. Fuck anointments. Slaughterhouse 3. Pretty straightforward. Complete all three circles of slaughter. Something I want to bring up with this achievement is that the Cistern of Slaughter is often overlooked. I didn't know there was a third circle until I started making this video. Right here at the heart of the Meridian Complex, and we just walk past it, completely ignoring it just to rush to story mode. Here comes the worst achievement, Good One Babe. Not only is this a secret achievement, it's one that's out of your control. During the first few sections you fight with Death Trap in Hammerlock's Big Gay Hunt, you, your Vault Hunter, does most of the killing. After that, you never fight with Death Trap again. I mean, technically you can, but... The best way to free yourself from this is by creating a new character and repeating the fight introduction you had with Gage. Something I've noticed is that when you create a new character starting with a DLC, there's a new intro cutscene. Unnecessary, but appreciated. Campaign starts, meet with Gage, and just sit back, maybe pitch in occasionally. When they're down to their last enemy, save and quit. Rinse and repeat. It'll take a while, but this is the fastest method I found. Plus the amount of kills Death Trap gets transfers to your other characters. As far as other achievements go, it's nothing complicated. Achievements in Borderlands aren't hard, just tedious if anything. Just take your time with it, don't rush, and you'll get there. Do every side mission, complete every challenge, unlock every location in the map. But when it comes to a 100% run, you have to do this with a single character. Even after two years of updates, Borderlands 3 is still a buggy game. My accomplishments were not registered and it got me worried that I was going to do all these achievements for nothing. But without losing hope, I did the tasks and was successful. Don't always believe the numbers in the challenge list. They don't tell the full story. You might have missed an exclamation mark somewhere. I say as if you're actually gonna do all this bullshit. Yes, it was annoying, but I only have myself to blame. I want this. The only way to know if a build works is to try all of them. And if you want to spend hours hoping to get that perfect gear to drop, here's some advice. Unless you're streaming it, unless you're getting paid for it, don't. That's called a gambling addiction. You're gambling your time. Just appreciate what you have. Part of the fun is discovering the maximum amount of damage you can inflict with the tools you're able to get. And my god, have I tried so many tools. Let's go over my main Amara. This was the character I chose at the start and used to complete all the side quests and map locations. 
Before I go over the build, let me just say, fuck the Guardian takedown, true difficulty. Fuck the Guardian takedown in general. I hate defending these stupid crystals. These are the skills, take a moment to pause. I occasionally switch between elements as well as Fracture and Phase Grasp. These are my items. Two Blade Furies, one for regular combat and one for when I go down. Guardian Angel for bossing, Kick Charger, optional. Fish Slap of various elements, Driver Class mod, Unleash the Dragon for bossing, Snowdrift Static Charge for mobbing. By the way, this isn't a guide. I mainly copied everyone else's build. I went with the full melee build after experimenting with the elemental damage only siren. Melee damage is just too good in this game, and I'm disappointed I didn't find out about the Blade Fury sooner, which allowed me to shoot melee damage projectiles. Really the only weapon I need on Amara. Probably shouldn't have spent so much time farming for face punchers. It really isn't necessary to switch between elements, since enemies die as soon as they come in contact with your projectiles. Honestly, everything dies too quickly. Add an uncontrollably fast movement speed, and you have to debuff yourself to make it challenging. But why would you want to do that, when you can treat bosses like jokes? Psycho Reaver dies from a grenade to its kneecaps. I shouldn't be allowed to do that. The highest health enemies? More like the no health enemies, or something, I don't know, that's all I got. When you have a build this good, the only downside is that it gets boring. Imagine having hundreds of weapons to choose from, and only one of them can do this. Which is where my click at their general direction and they die Moe's build comes in. What a refreshing build. I hope I don't regret it. Here are the skill trees. For this I'm rocking the Unkempt Herald, the Plague Bearer of various elements, the Hive, Kick Charger of various elements, the Infernal Wish, the Blood Letter, the Hex Grenade, and the Toboggan Artifact. It's so much more fun running around at super speeds shooting a rocket launcher that sends projectiles that act like that one weapon from Doom. I forget what it's called. It's like a big freaking gun. Even that is optional since your Iron Cup can do equally if not more damage with nukes that make every red dot on your map disappear. Plague Bearers are more fun to use, but it and the Hive do the same thing. Their differences are negligible. Even without the best anointments, overkill damage is guaranteed. So I go with the Unkempt Herald as my primary weapon. This build encapsulates pure power, but a bossing build it is not. Dear god, it's not good for bossing. So part way through the challenge, I changed my build, since I didn't want to spend 10 minutes fighting a single enemy. I went back to the Railgun build, as painful as it is to admit, and uh, it ain't much better. It was probably just this build in particular, so I went back to my old ways and learned to adapt. Instead of sticking to Iron Cub nukes all the time, I switched to Railguns when I needed to. Basically by having the Iron Cub be an extension to my launcher Moe's, I get the best of all worlds and the pure destruction that this build was meant to have. On second thought, maybe it's just Moe's. Jeez, this boss took me 15 minutes and I still lost. I ain't gonna lie to you. As fun as this was, I don't want to go back creating another build for Moe's. So I'm just gonna call this build a complete bust and not go any further. I was starting to miss shooting regular guns. So for Flak, these are the skill trees. I stuck to Gunslinger Jabber, but switched to Spider Ant Countess for more annoying enemies that bring me down. For Augments, I use Not My Circus for mobbing and Unblinking Eye for bossing. For items, Fire Rowan's Call, Shock Rowan's Call, Butcher. Funny story, this dropped from a random enemy, but I had to keep it because it came with perfect anointments. As for the build, it is completely optional. And of course, the Monarch in various elements. Revolter Shield, Stackbot Class Mod for bossing, Cosmic Stalker for mobbing. Hunter Seekers in various elemental anointments, and a Pearl of Ineffable Knowledge. This build is all shooting with the most balance between power and fun. Left clicking enemies to watch them explode is what gaming is about. But for the amount of critical hits Flak can do, this build is underwhelming. When it came to certain bosses, this is not the build I thought it was. Not being in Fade Away and having to constantly rely on it is a stressful experience. Flak goes down very quickly. Fortunately, the pet is a lifesaver when playing solo. I'm aware of the Rack melee build, 
but believe it or not, I want to shoot enemies in my first person shooter, and I already have a melee build for Amara. Visual Overload starts to show its ugly face with this build, especially when using the Butcher. I rarely use it simply because I can't see shit out of it. Not like it does significant damage, but it has its place against bigger bastards. If you're not a fan of blinking, I recommend this build. Save files is a term that gets thrown around in every build video, but I never knew what they meant. Instead of looking it up, I'd farm for every item they mentioned. You can see where I'm going with this. Out of all the characters, Zane took the longest to perfect. When I found out I've been spending over a week to get his build right, I gave up on farming and decided to download those save files. I was hesitant at first, not because I thought I'd be cheating, but because I was afraid I'd mess my game up. To my surprise, everything worked out. Save files aren't that hard to understand either, just drag and drop some files. With the amount of time I spent trying to make my own build, having this be given to me didn't feel like a reward that was earned. But I had to cut myself some slack. I truly wasted time farming for these items. I will be 100% transparent. This is the only build that has been completely fabricated. The items from the other builds were all me, as if you couldn't tell. With that said, we're using Boar Explosion. Yes, I caved. Whatever controversy is surrounding this build, I don't care. Here are the skills, here are the items. One of the most powerful builds in the game. I thought explosions can only get so big with Moe's. As soon as I understood how this build worked, I became Damage Incarnate. I used a Creamer rocket launcher for everything and tried to be careful with the Shocker. Kept my distance from the first explosion and let the second explosion do the rest. After a million explosions and flashing colors, I have succeeded in eliminating every boss with ease. Fuck the Guardian takedown. Now that I've done everything, what are my thoughts now compared to when I played Borderlands 3 for the first time? By the way, you should go watch my first Borderlands 3 video, I'm gonna be referring to it. Overall, my thoughts still haven't changed. Dialogue was still a chore to go through, and I'm gonna keep it real. I didn't pay attention to most of the side quests. A lot of them were uninteresting or unmemorable. The only ones that stuck with me were the references for good reasons, and the annoying ones for bad reasons. Burger delivery? If you know, you know. Seriously, what was this? Was this a reference to something? Don't let the burgers get cold, my dude! Gameplay is still phenomenal. I don't get sick of it. But it's not without its flaws. It didn't take long to find out that anointments are... bad. Not the concept itself, just how they're put in the game. Every weapon has a random anointment, and re-rolling for another costs an arm and a leg. They're so unreasonably expensive, especially when Iridium itself is already rare. Why couldn't they cost like 50 Iridium? Why are there so many of them? Why did they make it so that when you reroll, it has a chance to be a class specific for the one you're not playing as? There's no need to add another layer of random chance to an already luck-based gain. Or give us an option to earn more Iridium. There comes a moment where you have so much money, it becomes useless. After you get all your storage deck upgrades, there's nothing else you could spend your money on. Iridium, on the other hand, burns away so fast. So why not give us an option to trade money for Iridium? It'd be better if they got rid of anointments entirely. No one would be upset. The issue is when bonuses become necessities. Dedicated drop sources should not be a raid boss, or the last boss of a circle of slaughter, or proving grounds. Let's take a look at the Rowan's Call for example. 50% drop chance from Red Rain the final boss from the Slaughterhouse 3000. It takes at least 30 minutes to beat a Circle of Slaughter in Borderlands 3. Why are they so long? You do all that just for a coin flip. Now I get it's a world drop, it can come from anywhere, but since it has a higher chance of dropping from Red Rain, that's where most people are gonna farm. It should at least be guaranteed or have multiple drop sources. When I got the Butcher for my flak with the perfect anointment already attached, that was just a random world drop. The sheer luck from that drop was more surprising to me than any farming run I did. Mayhem mode is so much better than OP levels, and no one can disagree. A difficulty slider that you can tune at any time. The problems are modifiers. The modifiers that reward you like speed boost and loot explosion can stay, 
But then there are the ones that punish you for doing pretty much anything. Sure, it changes up your playstyle and forces you to adapt, but some of these are ridiculous. Standing too close to an enemy, killing an enemy, no fight for your life. On top of that, you don't get to choose which modifiers you want. It's randomized. Yeah, I get Mayhem 11 exists, but I just like my speed boost. Invincibility phases. We don't like them. Imagine fighting a boss that actively wastes your time. Oh wait. Yeah, they were okay at first. And I do mean the literal first time when we didn't know what to expect. It wouldn't be so bad if they gave you stuff to do like Scourge or Anathema. Even then, there should be a limit. 12 invincibility phases? There's a reason why you barely see anyone play this takedown. Speaking of... Takedowns need more checkpoints. Especially if I'm playing solo. If I die to a boss, I shouldn't have to start all the way from the beginning. Doom Eternal, this is not. The Malawan takedown is really the only way to do it. It's short, it's fun, it's hectic. It's like event missions. Do more takedowns like these, and less like the Guardian takedown in the future. I've noticed three out of the four characters, excluding Amara, have four letters in their name. Maybe should have kept that naming scheme, just putting that out there. I'm in no position to properly judge music, but I can appreciate a good track. Particularly when there's sentimental value behind a song or band. Borderlands started with Caged Elephant, so it should end with Alicia Keys, a staple in the Borderlands community. When I made my first Borderlands 3 video that you should go watch, I left out a part where I said they didn't have Caged Elephant in the end credits. Randy Pitchford mentioned in their Echoes from the Borderlands podcast that they had Caged the Elephant do a song for them. I went to both Caged Elephant and The Heavy and I was like, okay, let's let's do this right. We store, we kind of first sketched out an outline, so I told them what we were doing for the game and for the intro. And they're like, okay, so they started sketching demos. And then we took some of the like weird kind of tests they each were doing, and we storyboarded out our intro. And then I brought the storyboards back and I pitched them each, and they were making songs to it. The Heavy just like leaned in and they went directly to the, like, it was like we're on target. The Cage were like, they're, the song is awesome, but they were getting, like they were artists, you know? So they were kind of exploring their own shit a little bit. Right. So that we ended up licensing their song too for the end credits, I think. It wasn't clear if it was their test song or one of their old songs that they licensed, nor was I actively looking for the song in the end credits. I just assumed it wasn't gonna get any better after listening to Girl on Fire by Alicia Keys in its entirety. After I made the video, I was shocked when I found out that Cage the Elephant was played second to a generic pop song. It's almost like they didn't care about their legacy? I'm more upset that they chose that song more than anything, and probably spent more money on it too, considering how popular it is. Made me feel even less emotion towards Lilith's supposed death. No one actually thinks she died, right? No one's that gullible. I'm just saying they should have played Burn Bright by The Heavy. Far more appropriate. On second thought, I'm glad Trouble by Cage the Elephant played after Girl on Fire. They're better suited for the final game in the series. That's what I thought Borderlands 3 was at first. Since it took them 7 years to create Borderlands 3, I figured they were going to make the perfect conclusion to complete the trilogy. I was a fool to think Gearbox would get rid of their cash cow that soon. I'll give them this. Ever since I heard Trouble, I had that on repeat and from that point on I listened to their back catalog. Telescope? Black Madonna? God damn, why didn't you fucks tell me about them sooner? I love my fans. We need to give Cage the Elephant more credit than being called the Borderlands Band. Wait, who calls them that? I did. I didn't see anything special in them. So I guess in a way I have to thank Borderlands 3 for properly introducing me to them. By the time I start developing Alzheimer's, I'll probably be thinking about Cage the Elephant more than anything I did in Borderlands 3. Once you close this video, go listen to them. Caged Elephant deserves better.